Hello everyone, I'm ExtraTZ87 and this is a Let's Play Trails of Cold Steel 4 bonus video 2. So this time it's time to read our other miscellaneous books now that we're done with 3 and 9. I believe we have all of these. Uh, farewell, that seems like the last one. Chosen ones, yeah, alright, okay. I guess we'll start from uh, top to bottom there. I don't think there's anything else I want to mention real quick. Um, I don't think so. The finale went up yesterday. Um, since it's been several days since I recorded that first bonus video. And, uh, the response was really, like, great. Um, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun reading through the, the comments and everything over the course of yesterday. But, also, uh, I was asked to do... Um, there's another bonus video. I don't really know when this is gonna come out, but some of the bonus video other ideas that have been suggested to me, um, in addition to, like, the tier list, which I've been working on, I'm almost ready to start recording that, then, like, the long discussion video, which will be, um, an ordeal, but I'm looking forward to it. I'd also kind of like to do a video talking about, like, boss fights throughout the series, like, maybe, like, a, like, a top ten list of, like, my favorite fights not necessarily thematic like a mix of thematically but also in terms of like gameplay and like just the way it played out within the individual playthroughs i think that could be kind of fun um and I i'm open to other ideas i won't promise to do everything but there is a ton of stuff that could be explored over the course of uh the coming the coming times i don't know i don't necessarily have to do all the bonus videos within, within like a week or so that's another thing but um, let's go ahead and, and get to reading. Let's start with a Coco Panda's Tale. Hopefully it's not, like, as cursed as the Tomatario or whatever. My name is... Oh, you... What, what the hell is this, man? <laughs> Yui, you, you... Let's just call you Yu Yu. And I am a Coco Panda. People call us monsters. We're not all bad. Some of us are actually very nice. Um, I'm, I'm remembering all my encounters with pandas in the Trail Center... Trail Series... I don't know why I said center there. Uh, they are not very nice. They're very mean, and they one-shot you, and it sucks. Just like my friend, Tamario. He and I have known each other... Or Tam Tamario? Yeah, that seems right. He and I have known each other since we were cubs. Our whole lives, he was the kind of guy who did everything on his own, so everyone in our pack thought him a strong and independent loner. But I thought it must get hard having to do everything alone, so that's why I decided to follow him one day and make sure he was okay. And then you found him, what, murdering people or something? <laughs> I know how these books go. I hid behind a bush and watched him climb to the top of a big tree to get his dinner. After a while, he came back down, a nice big fruit in his paws. I breathed a sigh of relief. It seems like he would have more than enough to eat tonight. Also, does big fruit, is that a euphemism for like a child's liver? Because I, I don't trust these pandas. But just then, I took a better look at the fruit he had stolen and let out a small gas. It was rotten. Inside, there was an icky, mushy, and full of bugs. To make things worse, it was getting dark, and he wouldn't have time to look for more. All us cocoa pandas know that it's too mu much too dangerous to wander around outside at night. Camaro noticed how rotten his fruit was, too, and he looked up at the setting sun, and with a short sigh, he picked up his fruit and started to head back to our camp for the night. I followed him back to our den, making sure to not be seen, but then I heard his tummy rumbling. He must have been really hungry. I watched as he glanced at his fruit with a sour expression, then held his nose and prepared to take a bite. Tamaro, stop! I shouted, dashing out from my hiding place. You can't eat that fruit, it's rotten! I grabbed it out of his paw just in time. Though he was surprised at first, the expression on his face quickly turned to a frown. What's your problem, Yu Yu? You can't tell me what to eat! I was taken aback by how rude he was being. I was only trying to help. I got so flustered, I ended up speaking my mind to him right then and there. Look, if you can't find any food yourself, that's okay. All you need to do is ask someone to share with you. No way, he scoffed. Asking for help is like admitting you're two weeks to do it on your own. Uh, also, you're going to get eaten, you, you, at this rate. Don't be silly, I scolded him. It only makes sense for us all to help each other out. You're the only one who thinks that, you, you. He grumbled, crossing his arms. I don't understand why he was being so stubborn. Did he not trust the rest of us? Or was he just too proud to admit that he was wrong? Well, let's find out, shall we? I called one of the other Coco Pandas from our pack over to us. Hello there, you two. Something wrong? He said in a leisurely drawl as he walked over to Mero and I. We had trouble finding any good fruit today. Could we have some of yours? Absolutely not. 
Oh, is that all? No problem. Here you go. He said, hand in a seat for a fresh piece of fruit. I thanked him and waved goodbye as he left. See, I turned to Tamara. It really is just that easy. There's nothing to be ashamed of. In return, we just need to help the others out when they need it. Tamara made a face like he wanted to object, but he ended up taking the fruit all the same. Feeling like I'd finally gotten through to him, at least a little bit. I went back to my bed, hoping that he'd learn to rely more on others. By the time I'd woken up the next day, it was already past lunchtime, and I was still a little worried about Tamara, so I decided to keep an eye on him again. I went and snuck behind a bush and peeped through the leaves, but what I saw made my heart jump right into my throat. S something was very wrong. Tamara was covered in cuts and bruises, and he was growling more fierce than I'd ever heard him before. He's a were panda. T -t Tamara, what what's wrong? Are you okay? I asked timidly, coming out of my hiding place. He didn't seem to hear me. He didn't seem to react to me at all. He just kept staring at the path leading out of the forest and growling. I looked in the direction he was facing and saw a human walking down the path. As soon as I did, I knew something bad was about to happen. I reached my paw out, trying to place it on Tamara's shoulder. Before I could get close enough, however, he leapt at the human, tore away the bag they were carrying, and ran off deep into the woods. I was horrified. This wasn't like Tamara at all. I knew him better than anyone. Do you? Because I feel like you just talked to him like four times total, and he'd absolutely never attack someone like that. There was only one explanation. He must have got into his entities and become a mindless beast. Bro, 12 pages, what the hell? <laughs> Part 2, Yu Yu Stand. I sprang up suddenly, panicked and confused. After a moment or two, I realized I was in my bed and I slowly calmed myself and laid back down. It was all just a bad dream, right? It had seemed so real, though. I looked around, my tummy was telling me that it was still early, closer to breakfast time than lunch. I didn't think what had happened in my dream was real, so I was still worried about Tamara, and I went to check up on him just in case. However, I arrived at his bed to find it empty. Feeling a sinking sensation in the pit of my stomach, I called out to him. Tamara, where are you? As if in reply, a fearsome howl echoed off in the distance. Tamara's bed was the furthest one out in our camp. Out of everyone, he was the most at risk of being attacked by outsiders. I immediately took off, running as fast as my legs could carry me in the direction of the howl. In the direction the howl had come from. Before long, I reached the forest on the edge of our camp. I spotted Tamara in the middle of a clearing. He crouched low to the ground, holding a weapon he'd made out of an old gourd. I could tell from where I was that he was injured. His attention was focused entirely on his opponent, a bracken monkey. It must have been what had made that howl I heard. Something's wrong with that monkey. He must have gone feral. He's a funny, funny monkey. I grasped under my breath. Even monsters who can normally control their instincts can be driven wild and lose their minds when they're especially hungry or hurt, or they just see some punk bracers walking around minding their own business, thinking they get to walk around without being attacked by monsters. These stupid fools. What do they think they're doing? Just like what happened in my dream. Sometimes a strong blow to the head will bring them back to their senses, but often they'll never return to their old selves. They leave their packs and vanish into the wilds. I glanced at Tamara and he was already hurt pretty badly. I wonder if the Tamara from my dream was injured by the same bracken monkey. If the real Tamara was hurt anymore, he might turn feral too. Before I realized that I had stepped between him and the monkey. Don't worry Tamara, I'll protect you, I said. You, you, he grasped. I was so relieved to hear him call my name, tears started running down my face. He hadn't called Feral. That part of my dream hadn't come true, at least. Hey, Tamaro explained. This is no time to be crying. This guy's going wild. We need to knock him out faster. His voice trailed off. A look of alarm spread across his face as he glanced behind me. I turned around just in time to see the bracken monkey launch a flying kick right at my head. You, you, look out, Tamaro gasped. Right at the last second, I parried the monkey's kick and counterattack, sending them flying straight into a thick tree trunk. Damn, he's a badass. The wind knocked out of it, the monkey looked shocked and confused for a moment, before passing out. Wow, that really was a close one. I sure am glad I learned that move from that creepy sheepy. Uh, I said as I dusted myself off. Tamara let out a deep sigh and slumped down to the ground. I should have known you'd be okay, he said. You're the strongest one in our whole pack, after all. Well, a girl's gotta know a good self-defense move or two, I giggled. I realized then that I had Tamara's complete attention. I knew it could be my chance to finally get through to him. Why didn't you call for help as soon as that bracken monkey attacked you? I asked, frowning. Why should I call for help when it's something I could have handled myself? He shrugged. But you weren't handling it, and even if you had won the fight, you're so injured, you might have ended up going feral too, I told him. Yeah, well, so what if I had? He scoffed. That's got nothing to do with you. I couldn't believe that he had the nerve to say it to me. 
I didn't he realize how much I cared about him? I couldn't take it anymore. While I'm normally a very patient panda, he'd gone too far. I grabbed Samira by the shoulders and looked him right into the eyes. Listen, Samira, I know how hard you work, and I agree with you that getting help from others all the time without trying for yourself is just being lazy, but you're not that kind of panda. As long as your fear stop you from getting help when you need it, you can rely on everyone in the pack, and you can rely on me. You might like the idea that you're some strong independent loner, but in reality, when you push everyone away, you're just being self-absorbed. I stopped to catch my breath and waited for Tamira to say something in response. He lowered his face and I couldn't tell what he was thinking. After a moment, he opened his mouth and began to speak. You, you, I... I didn't hear anything past that. There was a flip sound and suddenly a sharp pain shot through the back of my head. I started to feel dizzy, but I some, sensed something moving around behind me. I figured the monkey must have woken up and thrown a stone at me. I was quickly at losing consciousness, but I knew if I passed out, Tamira would keep trying to fight on his own. He might end up turning feral. Please, Tamira, I grasped. I don't want to lose you. I'd be so sad if I couldn't see you anymore. There was so much more I wanted to tell him, but I couldn't find the words. My head was swimming, and it became harder and harder to think straight. As a panda who's very conscious about being, being ladylike, it's very... What does that even mean? It's very hard for, it to, for me to admit this, but I knew all my self-defense training had made me too tough for this to kill me. So why? Why was I... And then it happened. My thoughts slipped away and were replaced by pure instinct. I had become a mindless, feral Coco Panda. Part 3, Tamero's Decision. My name is Tamero and I'm a Coco Panda. I'm afraid to do things on my own, so I don't spend a lot of time with the others in my pack. When I'm in a crowd, all I can see is everyone hiding their two intentions, subtly fighting over territory, obsessing over social standing, giving fruit just to make sure someone else owes them a favor. It all makes me sick, that's why I moved my bed out to the edge of the camp. I thought I could avoid all that stuff, live my own, and solve my own problems. But you, you a panda I'd known since we were cubs, was always pestering me. We're both usually in the same part of camp, so why don't we hang out for a while, she'd ask. We're only in the same part of camp because you moved your bed closer to where mine is, I think to myself. Mira, stop, you can't eat that fruit, it's rotten, she said, grabbing my food out of my hand. What the fuck, man, I wanted those bugs. Honestly, I'd rather eat rotten fruit than, fruit than have to go beg someone else for theirs. Why don't you go over help as soon as that bracket monkey attacked you? She grabbed me, tears still in her eyes. I didn't have an answer. Maybe deep down, part of me knew that I was in trouble. She'd come to our rescue. You might like the idea there's some strong, independent loner, but in reality, when you push everyone away, you're just being self-absorbed. She was right, and any time things got truly difficult for me, I'd end up relying on her help in the end. I was only being stubborn because I wanted everyone to think I could handle things on my own. This whole time, I'd just been acting tough, but I couldn't keep it up anymore. You, I don't work hard at all. I'm just a pathetic excuse for a panda who's done nothing but take advantage of her kindness. I was only fooling myself thinking I was fine on my own. I'm such an idiot. But it was too late now. She probably couldn't even understand what I was saying anymore. She'd become a wild beast. And I watched as she approached the bracken monkey, snarling. I only took a few quick strikes from her before the monkey was collapsed in a heap on the ground. And I couldn't can tell that he wouldn't be waking up anytime soon. Yet I knew I couldn't relax just yet. Her opponent defeated, Yu Yu began to gnaw on the fern like crest on his head. I can only imagine that she saw it as just another plant in her feral state. Yu Yu, stop, I pleaded. Don't eat that. This isn't like you. I grabbed her and tried to pull her away, but it was no use. She was the strongest Coco Panda I knew. Even if she hadn't been exhausted from the battle, I wouldn't have been able to budge her. Or even if I hadn't been exhausted from the battle. I wasn't about to give up, though. I couldn't let my best friend lose herself like this. I looked around for a way to help her and saw my weapon lying on the ground nearby. I thought if I hit her for the just right, it might bring her back to her senses, but it was too risky. If I messed up, it'd just make her angry, and if I had to fight her, I could end up going feral too. And you wouldn't want that. You said you didn't want to lose me, I looked at her and dusted myself off. Well, I don't want to lose you either. If I don't stop, if I don't care what I have to do. It's time I stopped acting tough. I took a deep breath and shouted for help as loud as I possibly could. I shouted until I was completely out of breath, and it was the first time in my life I'd ever asked for help. But I didn't care anymore. Getting Yu Yu back to normal was the only thing that mattered to me. In mere moments, our entire pack had come to my side. Ah, oh, well, when we heard your fine asking for help, we're all so happy the whole pack ain't run, one of them said to me. I recognized him. He was the same panda who had cheered his food with us the other night. I never knew he could move that quickly. He'd always seemed kind of dopey to me, but now his eyes were sharp and focused. It's Yu Yu. She got her protected me, and now she's gone feral. Please, I need your help to calm her down. I stumbled over my words, trying to get them out as quick as I could. Everyone banded together to drag Yu away from the monkey and hold her still. Then, with a swift blow to the head, they knocked her out. 
He slumped to the ground and lay there as if he'd simply fallen asleep. I'll do the trick. Now I better go grab some of her favorite berries. Smell will help wake her up, helpful Coco Panda said. The others all went to gather some berries and placed them in a neat little pile right in front of Yu's face. After a few moments, her nose began to twitch, smelling the sweet fragrance, and her eyes fluttered open. I'm okay, she said, still a bit groggy. I couldn't believe my eyes. She was back to her old self. I was immediately overcome with relief, so much so that I might have even cried a little. It was then that I finally understood how she must have felt when she came to save me. Tamira, are you okay? My head hurts a little, but other than that, I'm fine, and... Huh? What are all you doing here? She looked at the rest of our pack with a bewildered expression. It was no wonder she was confused. I bet she never expected me to swallow my pride and ask the whole pack for help. Everyone looked on with warm smiles as I took Yu's paw in mine. I decided there and then that I wouldn't try and act tough anymore. I was going to tell her exactly how I felt. It's just like you said, it only makes sense for us to all help each other out. I turned to the rest of the pack. Thank you everyone for helping us, and thank you Yu Yu, I said turning back to her, for always being there for me. From that day on, I decided to give the other Coco Pandas a chance. It turns out that working together isn't so bad every now and then. We're all friends now, and the days I spend with Yu Yu and all the others are filled with smiles. This isn't a true Erebonian tale. What, the, the, no, nobody died? There was no traumatic uh, sibling murder? I don't buy it. There must be some Calvardian propaganda nonsense and those weak, lily-livered pansies over there. I don't know a true Erebonian children's story has to have at least a little bit of murder in it. All right, I guess we'll move on to if you say goodbye. Chapter one, Halcyon Days. No, 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 this wasn't meant to happen. The inventor stared down at what he had created, feeling no sense of accomplishment, only regret. Where he had, where had his life's work gone so quickly? Or gone so wrong, and more importantly, how could he find a way to fix his terrible mistake? For as long as he could remember, Sai had always loved building things, toys in particular. Day and night, he would toil in his workshop, dreaming up new playthings and bringing them into the world with his own two hands. People thought he was eccentric, to put it kindly, and kept their distance. At least the adults did. For the children of the town, going to the park and playing with size toys was a rare pleasure. He was always surprising them with new creations and wondering what he would come up with next. Could be just as fun as seeing the, ne seeing the final product. Sai, Sai, what are you making now? Martha tugged at Sai's sleeve. Stretching up on her tiptoes to see over the top of his workbench. Well, if it works out, these shoes will let you slide around like you're on ice wherever you go. Wow, that's so cool. Hey, can you make them leave behind like a colory tray on the ground too? And, and... The little girl bounced around the room, shouting out new ideas as they came to her. She was Sai's biggest fan, and in spite of the difference in their ages, also his best friend. If Sai was developing a new toy, you could bet Martha would be there too. Offering advice or just watching him work. Is watching me really that much fun? He'd ask her once. Yeah, well yeah, she replied. You always look so happy when you're making things, so that makes me happy too. Sai was on his way to the park to show off his latest inventions. He never took money from the children, seeing their, well, also their children, how much are they really going to pay you? Seeing their faces light up with joy was reward enough for him. He stumbled through the city streets, holding a pile of toys against his chest and doing his best not to knock at anyone. Sai, Sai! Sai came to a stop and looked around. Was that Martha calling him? Yeah, it had to be. Even in a crowd of people like this, he'd know, he'd know her voice anywhere. He'd arranged to meet her at the park like always, so why was she here? Sai scanned the oncoming sea of people for signs of his friend. The streets always been this crowded. There were other voices now, people yelling, run and get out of the way. Finally, Sai caught sight of Martha and in the same moment, realized what was going on. He ran towards her, the toys he'd been carrying, clattering carelessly to the ground. Martha, quick, over here. She reached out a hand to him, but it was too late. As the runaway horse-drawn carriage tore through the crowd, everything became a cacophony of crashing, crunching, and screaming, and then nothing. See, this is a true Erebonian tale right here. The rain came down hard, soaking Sai's hair and mingling with the tears running down his face. He ignored it and continued to gaze at the tiny grave. Don't you want to play with me anymore, Martha? Bro, what the fuck is this? <laughs> what the hell, man? Please play with me. Try out my toys like you used to. Tell me how to make them better, how to make them even more fun. The tears wouldn't stop coming, but Sai barely even noticed them anymore. Wait for me. I'll make something new, something you can play with even the way you are now. It'll be fun. So just is this about to be Erebonian Cemetery? We're gonna uh, or like we're gonna create a, a toy version of Martha and it's gonna go on a murdering killing rampage. Oh fuck man. Chapter 2, at any cost. 
Over the next two years, Si made countless trips to the cemetery. Every time, he'd lay toys on Martha's grave and the graves of other children, hoping for a chance to see them laugh and play again as they had in life. Only polite to share, right, Martha? These kids don't seem to like my toys so much, though. What am I doing wrong? Day after day, Si would speak to the empty air in front of the little gravestone. One day, he was sure he'd come back to find that the toys had moved or disappeared. But he was getting through to his old friend, but that day never came. Maybe it's the materials I'm using. Is that why you can't touch these? Hmm, if we think about it that way, then... His head alive with new ideas, Sai left the toys and shuffled back to his workshop to try something new. Time marched onward, and the young toy maker continued to place offerings at the grave to no avail. Then one evening, as the sun was going down, something occurred to him. An idea very different from his usual way of thinking. Only I could find a way to give you a body again. You could play with these just fine. No, dude. Haven't you seen any 80s horror movies? This is not going to work out, bro. Why well, hadn't he thought of that before? Finally had a direction to take his research in. 30 long years went by. Sai worked like a man possessed, barely eating or sleeping. His workshop decorated into a grimy, chaotic mess. His body became thin and emaciated. But he worked on, chasing after every last scrap of arcane knowledge he could find. He was determined to see Martha again, no matter the cost. It was a cold, crisp morning as Sai walked along to the all too familiar path of Martha's grave. A complex mess of steel and wires held under his arm. This was the result of his labors, a device that could, in theory, be used to give a spirit physical form. He switched it on and it began to emit a strange noise. It started as a low pitched drone, but it gradually got higher and higher penetrating through the air, through stone buildings, even through living flesh. It was as if the whole of reality being strained to its breaking point. The machine stopped and Sai looked around him. He didn't see Martha anywhere. Did it work? Something in the air did feel different. Picking up his device, Sai skulked away to investigate. Even before he reached town, it was obvious that all was not well. It was too quiet. Even at this time of day, there should be crowds of people bustling around as they made their way to work. Sure enough, the streets were full of people now, and every last one of them had fallen to the ground. They lay there motionless, as if their life had been drained out of them, leaving only empty husks. W what is this? I was trying to convert their souls into physical matter, not not this, so why? Sai felt his knees begin to buckle as he began to realize the full horror of what he had done. He ran throughout the town, desperate to find another living human. There had to be somebody out there besides him. No, 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 this is all wrong. This wasn't meant to happen. Sai sank to his knees as despair gripped his heart. They were all gone. He'd spent his life trying to make contact with the dead, and now he was the only living man left. Bro, what the, the who wrote this for, for children? I guess we don't necessarily know this isn't maybe a children's one, but it's still kind of fucked up. We probably got this book from a kid. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh God. And actually, you, you all buy these in the store, right? It's only the uh, the others you have to like collect from people, like the main ones. Chapter three, farewell. All Sai had wanted was to see Martha again, to make toys for his old friend and to see her smile again. How has such a simple desire led him to commit this atrocity against the laws of nature? The device felt heavy in his hands, but he kept hold of it all the same. Where'd I go wrong? How can I possibly make up for this? Somebody, please, somebody tell me what to do. And for a moment, it felt like something had brushed Sai's shoulder. It was probably just his imagination, but he was so desperate for human contact, his mind was playing tricks on him. But he couldn't help looking all the same. Nobody there. <laughs> of course not. All alone. The street was deathly silent, without so much as a breeze that disturbed the falling leaves on the ground. I smirked, ashamed of his own foolishness. How could he let himself get his hopes up like that? I finally got to see you smiling again, but you don't look happy at all. Sai knew that voice. He'd know it anywhere. He'd spent most of his life wishing he could hear it again. Martha, is that you? Please, if you're here, show yourself. Talk to me, Martha. He didn't care if it was real or a hallucination anymore. If Martha was here, there was hope. Sai broke into a run, scrambling through the streets, but there was no sign of Martha. Only her voice remained. I've been crying for such a long time, Sai. I thought you'd have found something to smile about by now. I'm not crying. Why would I be sad? It's not like you're gone. We'll see each other again someday, so... Even as he spoke, Sai realized what was wrong. His cheeks were wet with tears. How long had he been crying? 
Had he ever stopped since the day Martha was killed? Uh, deep down, I always knew that you were gone, that you weren't coming back. He tried to deny this, buried himself in his work to avoid thinking about it. There was no more hiding from the truth. I used to love making toys, I loved seeing the kids in the park play with them, but it was having my best friend alongside me that made it all worthwhile. I couldn't accept that you were gone, Martha. You were really dead. The words came spilling out and Sai became aware of a bright light that hadn't been there before. It was so dazzling he had to shield his eyes from it. All the long hours in his workshop for the last 30 years had made him indifferent to things like weather and natural light. You now a long forgotten sensation was beginning to stir in his mind. He remembered what it was like to walk with the warm sunshine kissing his skin. Sai fell to his knees. When he opened his eyes, he found himself face to face with his old friend. Sai won't get to play together anymore too, but as long as you can move on and keep living your life, I'll be right there with you. A smile finally broke through Sai's tears, a genuine one this time. One that made him look so much more like his old self again. I have to move on, Donna. Oh, Martha, I must have made you so sad all this time. Right, the machine you made is cool and all, but it's just not like you. You always seem happy when you're making toys. I guess you're right. When I try to make everything else, it always goes wrong. They stay like this for some time, chatting and catching up as if nothing had happened. And in the midst of that cold, empty world, there were still two souls with warmth in their heart. It was like a dream come true, but during a break in their conversation, I realized how quiet the rest of the town was. It was time for the dream to end. I have to go before everyone comes back. I told Eddie, I so you're not a bad person. You didn't mean to do this. I said she'd forgive you if you could let me go. Martha took a step backwards. Bye, Sai. I'm really happy I got to be friends with you, and I like it better when you smile. Sai took a deep breath and rose to his feet. He had to do this right. Tears were streaming down his face, but he kept his voice steady. Thank you, Martha. I'm so glad I got to see you again. And don't worry, I won't let you down. I'll have a good life, and I'll make you proud. Two words from him and the miracle that he'd worked so hard to achieve would be over. Part of him wanted to keep hiding from the truth. Make this moment last forever. But that temptation soon passed. He knew what he had to do, and he'd see his old friend off with the brightest smile he could muster. He wanted Martha to remember him like this. Goodbye, Martha. The girl was already starting to fade from view, as if melting into the sunlight. She kept waving the whole time until finally she was gone. Sai became dimly aware of a strange sound, a low-pitched drone that was gradually getting higher and higher. The world seemed to change in the blink of an eye. The town was once more teeming with life. People on their feet again, going about their business like nothing had happened. Sai walked through the streets in a daze. Perhaps it was instinct or nostalgia or Adios' guidance that led him to the park. Children gathered around him, looking at the strange machine under his arm. Hey mister, what's that thing? What's it for? How does it work? Sai so smiled. He knelt down and started tearing apart his invention, rearranging the component into something completely different. Ta-da! It's a butterfly! It uses orbital energy in the wind to fly! Wow, cool! I want one too! Let's have a race and see who can fly the farthest! Sai so worked quickly in a few minutes. The sky was alive with dancing butterflies and the laughter of children. But that was actually really good. Um... Definitely a little, a little fucked up <laughs> in comparison to Coco Panda, but uh, yeah, that one—that one's really good. I guess we'll round things out with uh, the legendary chosen one. Hopefully, it doesn't end with uh, I don't know some dude getting stabbed by his brother, like the last. Uh, what was the last one called? It was like the for the something hero. I can't remember. Is that they do seem to be kind of familiar in tone like this one's kind of like feels like a you know a kid's story same way as like tomatario this one's kind of like it's haunting and involves the the dead in the same way the, the the one at the museum did and then this one might be similar to the whatever the the last one was it was like something of hero i can't remember Chapter 1, Awakening Ondel's village was way out in the middle of nowhere. It didn't have any famous landmarks or specialty goods. There was no reason for anyone to visit it at all. Little by little, more and more of the villagers had to move out, or at least commute to Heimdall for work. Ondel was a curious boy by nature, so when his father offered to take him to the capital one day, he jumped at the chance. He wanted to see what made this place so special, and it wasn't long before he found out. Back home, nothing ever seemed to change from day to day, year to year. The big city was full of all kinds of things he'd never seen before.
I need to get to work, so stay here in the plaza and play until I'm done, his father told him. Hey, don't forget to uh, snag me a souvenir. Honda looked around the plaza. There were plenty of other children there. But his eyes were drawn to three kids standing off to one side. They were striking dramatic poses and making strange, exaggerated movements. I didn't like any game he'd seen before. Hey, uh, what are you guys playing? We're playing Legendary Heroes. We only learned it ourselves a while back. Andal's eyes lit up with excitement. Wow, that sounds so cool. How'd you find out about it? A funny story. This weird kid showed up one day and taught everyone how to play it. But none of us had ever seen them before and they talked kind of weird. Like they were from olden times or something. Awesome. Wish I could get cool ideas like that. We don't know how much of it's true, but whatever. Don't think about it too much and just have fun with it, okay? Sounds good. Can you teach me how to play too? The game of Legendary Heroes involves setting up a peculiar ritual with tree brain. Oh god, with tree brains is to infuse you with ancient power. Oh fuck. Oh shit. When that was done, the first thing that popped into each hero's head became their sacred mission. Don't think about murder. Don't think about murder. Don't think about murder. Before long, Andal and the others had become fast friends, and soon enough, his father arrived to take him home. The next day, Andal went to tell his friends Monty and Keith about everything he'd seen in the capital, including the new game. I don't know, it sounds kind of weird. What do you even do? He's always trying to act grown up. Sometimes it took a lot to convince him to join in with his friend's games. Monty on the other hand tended to be shy and timid, but he liked the sound of this. We don't have to fight bad guys or do anything scary, then maybe it won't be so bad. Yeah, we might even get to turn to legendary heroes for real. <laughs> yeah, right. Come on, let's get this over with. We'll probably get bored of it after an hour or so. Andal set up the ritual, oh fuck, just the way his friends in the city had shown him. He gathered ten tree branches and struck them to the ground in a roughly circular pattern, oh god. Then he, Monty, and Key stepped into the circle and chanted the magic spell. We call upon the power of the Ancient Ones. Each friend then picked up one of the sticks and held it aloft like a sword. So the sticks are in our magic circle, right? It's filling us with this ancient power, just like the heroes from the olden times. Andal struck a dramatic pose, as if this moment was far too important to let pass without doing something special to mark it. What, you're gonna- Huh? Keith was cut off by a clatter as the seven sticks all fell down one after another, forming a strange symbol. They began to glow, getting brighter and brighter, and soon the three friends were engulfed in an ethereal light. Andal looked up at the sky and seemed to hear a solemn voice speaking directly into his mind. Ye who have gathered here, I grant unto you the power to change your destiny, and also murder people, probably. I don't know, you're not gonna get one over on me, man. Chapter 2, Conquest The voice finished speaking, and three pillars of light descended from the heavens into the three boys. Then it vanished as quickly as it came. They looked at the sky again, and then at each other. Had all that been real? You think maybe we got into the so, so into the game we started hearing things? No way, we all heard the same thing. It had to be real. Always said it would give us power. Maybe we can, I don't know, use some kind of special skills now or something? Ando tried waving his arms around, but nothing happened. Oh, I'm sorry, Ando. You have to progress to at least chapter 5 of the story before you can lock your S craft. Come on now, give us some kind of hint. Ando tried raising his arm once more. Suddenly there was a crackle of energy and lightning or something that looked like it started to shoot out of his palm. Whoa, the, what the, you see that? Come on guys, you try it too! Following their friend's example, the other boys raised their hands. A wild wind shot out of Monty's while Keith unleashed a torrent of fire. Ando was thrilled. It worked, we got the hero's ancient power for real! With this we could like take over the world or something. That'd be cool, right? Um... The others were less enthusiastic about their new crown powers. I could never do that. I get scared just talking in front of big groups of people, based. We can't go showing off this power to just anybody. We have to keep a secret or else people try and use it for crimes and stuff. I mean, like, yeah, you're right. Whatever, nerd. Ando couldn't believe his ears. What's wrong with you guys? We were given these powers for a reason. We can't just waste them. Well, fine. If you're chicken, I'll do it myself. Before they could reply, he stomped away, leaving them still a little dazed and confused about what had just transpired. I mean... On one hand, I guess it's cool being able to shoot lightning out of your palm, but like, can't you just do that anyway? Because you just grab a magic rock and put it in your fancy thing. I mean, it's not going to let you take over the world, basically, is what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you might be able to, like, take over your village, maybe, until the police show up and then shoot you. Because they're going to be immune to your lightning, because they're going to have a uh, freaking magic of aid quartz. Still a little dazed and confused with what had just transpired. I'll show them. I'll show them all. Taking over the world be a cinch. And I'll start with the kids in the palace. 
The next morning, Andal stuck out of his, snuck out of his house and went to the capital alone. He found all the kids of the plaza. Oh yeah, plaza. I don't know why I said palace. Cause I, I was like even confused. I'm like, what palace is he talking about? <laughs> At the kids in the plaza and showed them his new trick. Check it out. It worked. Oh, a legend, real legendary hero now. Wow, that's so cool. You could shoot beams without using an orbit or anything. This is exactly the reaction Andal had been hoping for. What was wrong with Keith and Monty? Who wouldn't want to be a hero enough people admire him like this? I'm gonna tell everyone about this and take over the world. Follow me. With another mighty cheer, they all set off joyously. Ando now set his sights on the cities of grown-ups. He showed his power to them just as he had the kids, but it didn't work out the way he expected. None of them took him seriously. They all thought it was just some kind of childish game and told another to play with ornaments. Ando grew impatient. He raised his palm again and again, and with each bolt he sent into the sky, the clouds got darker and darker. And before long, a storm was raging up above. Lightning struck an orbital streetlight, shattering the glass and bending the pole into a strange, twisted shape. See, not just anybody can do that, right? Uh, yeah, it's called Ixion Volt. Oh, fuck, man! Quit, quit, you know, just raining on my parade! And that got their attention. People who had been passing by were now stopping to stare at the destruction. I use this power to become a legendary hero. Follow me to glory. Now they'd all fall in line and cheer for him, or so Andal thought. One old man clearly had other ideas. Now look here, Sonny. Enough of this horseplay. You can't go around smashing up things like that. What have you done when them bolts that hit someone, eh? What if you'd hurt one of your friends or burn someone's house down? Andal then killed this old man because he was a blasphemer. The words shook Andal. They had even more dramatic effect on the crowd. Everyone started to lose interest and wander off, even the kids who had followed him all this way. It's supposed to be three heroes, right? Curied one kid? This guy's gotta be fake. Slowly but surely, they all disappeared. I'm not a fake, it's true, you saw what I can do. Right, I'm the chosen one. They wouldn't listen. Dejected and alone, Andal dashed down a back alley. He was afraid he might burst into tears, but he didn't want anyone to see that. Eventually, he found himself at an empty lot. He thought he was finally alone, but then a man appeared, seemingly out of nowhere. Hey kid, you're one of those legendary heroes, right? Don't worry, I believe in you. You're the real deal, I can tell. Finally, somebody who understood. Thanks. I was kind of starting to wonder if I'd made some sort of mistake. The man knelt down so he could look Andal right in the eye. I think the only mistake you made was not going far enough. Something about the way the man spoke was unsettling. Suddenly, Andal felt a pressure over his mouth and a strange smell, and he started to feel very sleepy. <laughs> Can't believe he fell for that. Some chosen one he turned out to be. With that, the man hoisted Andal over his shoulder and stuffed him into the back of an old car. Oh, fuck, man. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, shit. Chapter 3, The Chosen Ones When he woke up, Ando was still in the backseat of the car. The strange man from before was driving. Ah, uh, you're away. Don't get any funny ideas, alright? I got friends stationed in your village. You try and escape, I give them the signal to torch the place, understand? What are you gonna do with me? Ando was trying his best not to sound scared. It's a real talent you got there. It's like you said. Not just anybody can call down lightning without using a quartz or word mint. When I see it, there's all kinds of ways I can make money off you. The man spoke casually as if kidnapping a child of the streets and threatening an entire village is the most natural thing in the world. What if, Andal, you uh, zapped him and unleashed your unlimited power, and then how the hell is he going to tell the people of the village who probably don't even exist, who it's probably just an empty threat, just melt his face off and, uh, I don't know, go extort people to get ice cream. Andal hadn't been tied up or gagged, he still felt trapped. There were probably countless ways to escape in the situation, but he had no choice but to stay put. What am I doing, he thought. I don't know what to do with this guy, so I could probably knock him out with a bolt of lightning. What if I mess up and kill him? What if he gets his signal out and his friends burn down the village? I don't remember how the old man in Heimdall had scolded him for his irresponsible behavior and the way his friends back home had acted. Keith and Monty were right. I'm no hero. Showing off just to get people mad at me and now I'm in this mess? Being given a special power that was uniquely his had gone to his head. But he saw the truth now. He was still just a kid, and the situation had been put in made him feel more helpless than ever. Kidnapper smirked. Say goodbye to Erebonia, kids. Odds are you ain't gonna see it again for a long time. Oh, well, in that case, in that case, maybe it's not such a bad thing. There was no response. In fact, the back of the car was unusually quiet for all of a sudden. The kid just sulking. He just the rearview mirror. Hey, I don't know what you're up to, but, uh, he was gone. There's no sign of Andel anywhere. He never tried to twist around to see it better, but the next moment a shock went through his entire body. Andal crouched behind the driver's seat and unleashed one of his bolts. 
What, you little... The shock wasn't enough to knock the kidnapper out, but it did slow him down long enough for Andal to grab the steering wheel. The car veered off the edge of the road, swerving in every direction. You you're gonna kill us both! The kidnapper rinsed the wheel away, just in time to avoid crashing into a tree, and slammed on the brakes, hard. While he was doing that, Andal used a lightning punch to shatter the passenger side window, giving him the perfect escape route. Nah, man. You could... I think you could get away with killing this guy. If I'm being honest, you know, you're in a dangerous situation, you've been kidnapped, he's threatened to kill people, you know, if you want to pop his brain like a grape with your lightning bolt, no one would be mad at you. So long, sucker, thanks for slowing down for me. A moment later, he jumped, entrusting his safety to Adios. I know I'm just a kid, but anything bad happens, there's no way I'm able to make up for it, but I can't just sit around and let this happen. I can figure, I figure I can still do something. For a moment, it seemed like Andel was going to hit every branch on every tree before it being dashed on the cliffs below. Then a blast of wind blew the branches aside and slowed his descent. And he felt something, no, someone, knock into him, and they both tumbled to the ground. They were shaken, but still very much alive. Ando looked at the person who'd stepped in to rescue him. It was Monty, the boy who'd been blessed with the power of the wind. He was panting for breath, but still made to choke out a wry laugh. I never thought you'd actually get kidnapped. I thought that kind of stuff only happened in books. <laughs> yeah, thanks man, I would've been a goner for sure if you hadn't been here. I'm sorry I got so carried over the whole world domination fantasy. I was being really dumb. No worries, I wasn't sure I could be brave enough to do something like this. But when I saw you jump out the window, I didn't ever think about it. It just kind of happened. Why the hell were you here? No sooner had Monty finished his speech, than they had heard a loud bang from behind them when the orbital car had been. They quickly turned to look. When Andel jumped, the kidnapper didn't chase after him. He was having enough trouble just trying to right the car and save his own skin. Stupid bro, I'm gonna let the others know about this. You're in for it now! Driving out of the forest and back onto a solid road, he grabbed his communication device. The voice that answered him didn't sound like any of his allies. It sounded a lot younger. Sorry, your buddies are all tied up. You're the only one left. Looks like you saved us the trouble of finding you. It was true. By some strange coincidence, the car had come to rest on the outskirts of Andel's village. And there was Keith, holding another comm device and fixing the kidnapper with a fierce look. Damn it, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm sick and tired of you kids. Give me the runaround. He floored the accelerator, ready to drive right through Keith if necessary. The boy stayed calm and sent a stream of water out of his hands. Aiming at the car's front tires, I thought he had fire. But they burst with a mighty bang and the car sprung out of control towards another large tree. He summoned another stream of water, turning the ground to mud and stopping the vehicles in its track. He sighed. Here I told Anna we should keep these powers secret. I guess it's okay to use them a little if it means helping people. With the kidnapper and his gang under lock and key, Ando was free to return home to his friends and family. His parents scolded him for running off in the first place, but they hugged him that much harder now that they knew he was alright. At the time, he couldn't put how he was feeling into words, but he could tell something to change. He'd taken his first real step towards growing up. This is just a story, of course, but you see the point I'm trying to make, right? Power on its own isn't good for anything. Whatever kind of strength or talent you might have, think hard about how you can use it to improve the lives of others. Understand? Yes, sir! It was another normal day at a normal little academy. Instructor Ando was well liked by his students. He always told the best stories. No one really knew what he did outside of working hours though. And no one would ever connect with him or his two friends. So the mysterious team that worked so hard to protect people, people of Erebonia from the shadows. This was a group no one knew for sure even existed. It was just a rumor, an urban legend. And they had been chosen to wield power unlike anyone else. And in their own way, they had become heroes. I think it's like he had fire, crackle of lightning, wow, oh it says torrent of water, I guess I just read torrent of fire in my head, alright, that one's okay, definitely the if you say goodbye, the standout, probably the overall best of the mini novels in this game in CS3, I had to do a quick ranking, I don't remember the ones in CS3, there was Tomatario, the museum one and the one about the hero. If you say goodbye is definitely the best. Then uh, I don't really remember the museum one that well. Okay, I remember liking it. Maybe the museum one, the hero one from CS3. Coco Panda, 
Tomatario Mortal Heroes. I'll, I'll, I won't put Tomatario in last place. It was at least kind of surreal in a way. I'll give it some bonus wins for that. But yeah, um, I will. That's what we'll say. If you say goodbye, definitely by far the best. But those are okay. Those are kind of interesting. I don't think anything else we need to do like in game while we're here. I don't think so. We saw all the S crafts. We did everything. Um, oh, actually, there is something I kind of would like to do. All right, I'll have to pause to set it up. Slash, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll pause and set it up, and I'll be right back. Oh, I admit. So yeah, Perhaps we're gonna we see the uh, salt field dialogue. Speak of something besides battle that we missed. Oh, yes, certainly. <laughs> so Duvali. Oh God. How far were you yeah. able to get with the Ashen Chevalier? Pots or Inessa and Anaya. Anaya, now is not the time. <laughs> oh, what are you getting all flustered about? Oh, very interesting. You two stay out of this. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we missed some salt pale dialogue back here because, well, they make it so it only procs if you actually beat one of the demons, which is like one of the big boy demons, which is like really dumb. Um, don't 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 pay attention to the fact that the whole fucking squad is dead. That there's nothing there's nothing to be seen there. Oh god, now I gotta find the save that I was using. That because there's one we had a save right when we finished with Estelle's crew. I don't, I don't know where it is. Okay, Imperial Fortress, it would be... Is this it? No, that's Duvali. There's one with Rin. There we go. This is why you should just give me infinite saves. But yeah, true. Um... Just save the damn game. Alright. So, we'll probably pause and I'll set up the next fight since we actually have to do the entire demon fight. So we want to do... Like we miss Lloyd's and... Okay, maybe we'll just do Lloyd's. Yeah, maybe we'll just do that. Alright, so we'll, we'll do Lloyd's crew and then my lawyers have informed me that we legally can't listen to Angelica's right in the next uh, week. dialogue. So we will not be doing that one. I'm making a stand, all right? Because upon thinking about <laughs> who is in that group, compared to my uncle. I don't want to hear it. Well, not many can measure up to the Red Constellation. Even so, each of us has improved by leaps and bounds in the last two years. And now it's time to show them what we're made of. Yeah, remember we were fighting the slime monster? Help me in too. Good, good I'll old do days. All I, can to help. I don't know why it's making that noise, if I'm being honest. I don't, I don't know. What are you? Why are you? Why are you making that noise? Yes. Yes. Oh, I think it's just my controller's trigger is fucked up. But all right. Um. Yeah. I. I just don't want to see Angelica. If I'm being honest, it's got Angelica Sharon. What's her name? <laughs> Emma. What's your grandmother's name? Roselia and George. There's. There's no good dialogue there. It's impossible. You can't have those four characters have an enjoyable interaction. But that was worth it for the, uh, the, the, the Star Raider one was pretty good. But yeah, uh, you, you can't, I'm not, you're not going to listen to it. Nope, 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 it's the end of the video. End of the video, goodbye. Uh, we'll see the video future or something, I don't know. We'll do some more stuff. We still got, tier, I'll probably do tier list first before the discussion video, because A, I've done more work on the tier list video than I have on the discussion video. And, uh... So yeah, we'll do tier list first. Um, well. Other miscellaneous bonus videos will happen whenever. Now then. Definitely want to do one about the fights and stuff. Could be kind of fun to, to talk about. And then the long discussion video, which will be an ordeal. But yeah, I'm Extra Cheesy 87 Stay tuned for the next part or next bonus video, whatever. Goodbye.